Welcome into the Friday, March 29, 2024 installment of Market Plus. Our panel is with us. They stuck around after what we just did in that main show, which we hit a lot of, of the market. Sean O'Leary is here. Him and Jeff French are on that side of the table. There's Jeff and Sean. Don Rose over here. Good to see you, Don. Good to see you, Paul. You know, I... I want it. I want the record to reflect. I didn't pick on you once during that show, did I? That's unusual. I know. So I mean, I'm ready. So we'll get first question now. <laughs> okay. We're gonna start on inputs. Ryan in Iowa asked us on Facebook, why is anhydrous so high? Well, you know, he's got a good question. One is down substantially from what it was. You know, it's almost in half, but uh, from the top. But I think when you really look at it, he's right. It's a big disconnect because look at natural gas. I mean, it's down here at multi, multi-year lows, and uh, for the most part, anhydrous. It's it's made from natural gas, big percentage. So. Um, I think it's simply because, why is the price up here? I think because it can be. Um, you know, same thing with tractors. Why are they up here? You know, I think it's that type of a thing. But no, I mean, it's got the potential to come back down more. Sean, is this only a demand story right now with anhydrous? Or is well, it a supply issue? Uh, I, I think Don has a good point. If you look at uh, what our corn and, and bean markets have done, uh, I'd, I'd say there's a little bit of a disconnect there, too. If, if if uh, the prices are that much out of line with each other. Uh, somebody had mentioned land sales and how, how strong those are still as well. And uh, it, it, it doesn't look as attractive when you look at the price of corn and beans. And overall economy, Michigan sentiment numbers were at some of their highest. That was a huge jump today that wasn't expected. Sentiment has been low in a lot of these reports. So maybe the other part of the economy is, is thinking things are up. But, Jeff, uh, since we've seen each other a lot here in 2024, uh, we've, I've asked you quite often about the, the acre story. You knew this was coming. We knew you were coming today. But given this incredible amount of fall field work that was done, is the high end hydra even a story, given all the work that's done and then the intentions to, to maybe switch to beans? Well, I think it's a story because what corn prices are. And, and that, that has improved here in the last couple of weeks. But uh, yeah, when you have the inputs uh, as high as they are with uh, corn prices as low as they are down here at four or five year lows, uh, it, it's a much bigger deal uh, besides when you have 550 or $6 corn. Um, but, you know, fertilizer is the ultimate world market. I mean, it, it's, it's uh, sold and bought everywhere. And, you know, farm ground continues to expand. I mean, Brazil in the last four years has expanded 15 million acres. Uh, and they're not slowing down. Uh, so the demand is going to continue to grow. Sean, this one's going to be for you. Kurt in Iowa wants to know, what kind of short or long-term impact will the most recent new headlines a uh, little bit about avian flu and the Maryland Bridge, have on the ag economy in general. And if you can, tailor any answer to the live cattle market. You kind of did in the main show, so I kind of want you to say it again for those in the back of the congregation. Well, um, the, the bridge collapse, I think, is, is uh, not going to have that much of an impact. Uh, it's going to take a long time to get that replaced, but I think uh, initially they talked about uh, a floating bridge to, uh, to get things moving again. Um, but uh, when, it, when it comes to the cattle market, I think you're just going to continue to see a fair amount of volatility there. And... Uh, you know, uh, it's, it plays out uh, plays out uh, on a daily basis, and uh, you know, it's uh, I, I go back to to, to uh, the uh, e mini S P, and as long as that stays strong, I think the demand will be there. Let's a little bit in livestock, but a little different here, Don. This one's going to be for you, Christine, or no, that's Christy in Wisconsin. Christy, like next week. Uh, Christy wants to know, when will the price of calves, particularly bull calves, start to come back down in price? And what time frame do you see this happening? Is there any correlation on bull calves to cattle weights and feeders? And it's always tied together, isn't it? Well, I mean, I think the bull calves, when will the price come down? I think what she's really saying is, you know, you're with the feeder cattle as high as they are, that, you know, you're putting, you know, 
all the animals on feed as possible. So when will the bull calves start to come down is probably when the market starts to uh, relax back down and it doesn't look as attractive to place cattle or, uh, you know, when the demand starts to pick up on the other side. Jeff, you get to have Phil in Ontario's question. You ready for this one? He, right. We've already answered part of Phil's question in the main show, but uh, Phil wants to know, what is the potential impact of bird flu? We talked about that. But what I want you to focus on is here. What demand categories in Thursday's USDA report may offer hope for corn prices? Or is this mostly about a future weather market for the growing Brazil safrina corn crop? You kind of talked about both of those in the show. Yeah, I think the... the you know, as we progress here, the, the Brazil safrina corn crop weather is getting less and less. I, I mean, they've had really good rains, and actually, uh, you know, Argentina was getting too much rain, and that's backed off here a little bit. Uh, you know, the story on the report there Thursday with the corn, um, you know, seasonally, right now, we should be working higher into the growing season. And you got to look at, you know, the funds as short as they are. Let's say they're short 170, 180,000 contracts. I mean, do they want to be short all that corn uh, going through planting and then going into the first part of the growing season? History would say no, but we'll have to see what happens here this spring. Hey, any take on that one? Well, I, I, I think Jeff has a good point. Um, I, I would just submit that uh, if you're trying to make money on the long side of corn or beans and you have to rely on weather, quite often you're going to be disappointed. Not to say we're not going to have an issue at some point, but uh, you know, I, I think any given year, chances are things will get done in a timely fashion. Most areas, east, east and west, will have decent weather. Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a one, once every ten or twelve years issue where we have something that's that's a major hiccup. We talked about the weather uh, before we started rolling and how it rained and, the, and we discussed, but do you have clients that were itching to go and this rain slowed them down for making that decision of starting a little too early? Well, I'd, I'd say it is plenty early, plenty early, yeah. But do you think that, Don, an early crop, what happens if the thing does get planted super early. We're done by May 1. Well, you know, you still long growing season, so you got to plant it. You still have to get through pollination. So, you know, I think that's one thing. But, you know, you were talking about the funds, and I was just thinking about this. You know, the funds are short, we'll say 200,000 contracts, a billion bushels. Well, the farmers long about 5 billion. So, I mean, it's kind of this battleground. Who's going to win this war? And it's probably going to come down to weather, like you're saying, Paul. Recently, I've been asking, as we're about to head into the field, and we have some folks that are going to be, you know, pretty focused on getting that crop in. Give me some advice for a producer who, I'm not saying set it and forget it, but what should they be trying to just high-level things look for in the next six to eight weeks? Well, I think the number one thing you look at is, you know, what do you, what's my break even and what do I need to do to survive until we see once what's going to really happen in these years going forward. Are we going to eventually be trading three fifty to four dollar cash corn or is it going to be, you know, four fifty to five? And we don't know. We're in that transition, Paul. So I would say protect yourself when you have the chance to and uh, make sure you're doing a good job. The next uh, you're talking about six weeks. That's what I would be doing. Do you remember what Sean said? It, it, five seems so long ago, but he's right. He does, except if you look at corn today, we went to, what, 480 on D's corn? We were sniffing it, yeah. Right, and you put a carry on the market out to July of, let's just say, 30 cents with the way we're at. You're at 510 out in July, probably, eventually. Um, put a basis on that, and you're at five. Sean, does your phone start ringing Monday if we close over five? Or, I mean, on Tuesday, I should say. Uh... I, I think that would get a lot of people interested, and uh, I, I think, as Don said, you know, you, you have to take some protection. Um, and I, I just go back to last year, and uh, it happened early, but it was brief. And uh, there's a lot you can do. You, you don't have to make an actual cash sale. You don't have to sell futures on the board. There's plenty of option strategies, including. Uh, covered short call strategies. You, that's, that's a strategy, you have limited profit potential, limited risk. You leave the upside open. Those are positions you can kind of scale into uh, without thinking, you know, you, you just made a sale and, and it's done for. Well, 
uh, Jeff, I'm going to ask you this because I'm trying to find my note so I make sure I get this right. We, I think, had some of the highest stocks on ethanol in more than a year. Crude oil continues to creep up. Or is that play into this discussion? on Six-month high, I think, in crude, $83, $84 a barrel. You know, with, you know, we'll see. I mean, the, the Fed said they're going to cut rates three times this year. Uh, the economic indicators are saying uh, slow down on that. So I don't see too much downside uh, right now in the crude. And, and if you go back in the last year, I mean, $70 has been a very good floor. Now we've gotten above 80. We've held that here for the last week and a half. Um, but yeah, that makes everything more expensive uh, to produce, uh, but also it does lend support, especially to the bean complex. Don, last question, the dollar. The volatility, at least this week, wasn't there. Will it come back? Well, you have to be very concerned with the dollar because we're printing a lot of money. I think over the next uh, year, we're going to go up another $3 trillion in debt. So the more debt you have, the weaker the dollar historically says. I would say you have to be careful that the dollar hasn't topped out. Look at some of these other, uh, like, bitcoins. I mean, people are looking for alternatives to the dollar, unfortunately. Welcome into Market Plus Plus as we cover Bitcoin next time. <laughs> Thanks, Don. Don Rose. Thank you. Good to see you. Sean O'Leary, thank you very much. Thank Jeff you. French, thank gentlemen, you. thank you. appreciate your time. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Next week, we are going to look at the battle with feral hogs, and Christy Van On Cheeseth will join us to share her views of the markets. Thank you so very much for joining us, and have a great week.